Today we're going to be diving into a few prisons. Iowa, California, Indiana, I think. I don't know. I lost track. We got a few to go down, but we're going to be speaking about the convict code, right? Like those unspoken rules that everyone should know about. They're pretty much universal wherever you go, but some states, you know, can be ran a bit different. We're going to see both sides of them today. So if you enjoy this type of content, all things lockup related, then this is where you want to be. Hit that like, subscribe, notification bell before you leave and check out my playlist with many more videos for you to start watching today. I believe we're starting off in Utah. These guys playing cards are going to break down a little bit of what happens to inmates they don't approve of. The guards here don't run your sections there. It's all run by, you know, by your inmates. You know, they, they pretty much tell what goes on. You know, a guard does their section, but the inmates are pretty much, they don't get along, then they're going to either force them out or they'll get moved. They'll get moved. They'll straight out get told, you get your ass down to the pot. Hit the bus. Pack your stuff and get out. Here you go. That's exactly what I'm welcome on the block. The guards are just in there as you know. They distribute all the food. They, they mean, they're only in there to make sure nothing major goes on. They're other than that, inmates run everything else. See, you'll hear a lot of guys tell stories about how inmates run the prison, but I don't see them leaving the prison. If they run it, then why ain't they opening up the damn gates and going home? They run the inmate population to an extent, man. The COs, no matter where you go, they'll always have control. Even if you happen to take over the prison trust and believe the state police, National Guard, whatever's gonna roll in and have control again. But don't get it twisted. There's a lot of states out there where inmates got guards under the payroll. And when that happens, man, yeah, that inmate, he could run a lot of things, but still there's always a level of control there by the COs. If not, then it ain't a prison no more. It'd just be like an apartment complex. They got their rules, we got ours, you know? There's a code of conduct in here that you gotta follow. If you wanna, you know, make your time easy, you know? You don't rat on people. Uh, all kinds of stuff. No, you don't do. Now that is a serious convict code, man. Look, you don't be telling on nobody. Keep your mouth shut. No matter what the situation is, it's just how it goes. If you look up, the fourth deck's pretty high, you know? A lot of people, people take an elevator ride. The problem is there ain't no elevator. The fall doesn't hurt them. It's a sudden stop at the end. <laughs> this guy right here's done over 23 years behind bars. The convict code is a person that carries himself with respect he doesn't he only talks to the man when he has to you know he don't sit there and kick it with the man you don't tell on nobody you don't let nobody know your business you don't you don't get in other people's business you respect yourself you respect others around you the different breed of inmate that's coming to the joint now you know you got kids coming in here you know some of them are gangbangers that don't know how to carry themselves and some of them they just don't give a about respect. The biggest piece of information that he said, if you were to ask me, is don't talk about nobody else. Don't get into nobody else's business. I promise in prison, just like the streets, you talk about someone, eventually they're going to hear about it. But in prison, you can't run from them. You can't block them. You can't do none of that. So once he gets word, you're going to have to handle that situation. But some states, you know, the code of conduct can be a bit different especially in California. So let's go ahead and jump over there and see what these guys have to say in San Quentin. Always spot a guy that's not used to prison, a new inmate, uh, because he'll come out, he'll wander around, he won't go with his own group, you know, he's just looking. And uh, usually what will happen is uh, uh, one of the gangsters will go over and snatch him up and bring him over and run the, run the game down to him, tell him, hey, this is what you've got to do. This is where you've got to be. You can only hang out with your own people. We don't want to see you talking to people of other races. And uh, that happens real quick, real quick. A lot of people have asked me to do reactions on movies when it comes down to prison, like Shot Caller, for instance. Well, it sounds like in the movie, it's pretty similar to what the guard just said. You know, as soon as he walked into the yard, a group of white guys came up to him and said, hey, this is what it is. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, man. You know, uh, a lot of people that I've seen come through the Virginia prison system, if they had individuals like that come up to them and say, hey, we, this is the procedure, this is the process, it would have saved them a lot of trouble. 
have a little bit of protection rather than just being by himself, you know, but sometimes that protection can come with a price. So there's some benefits and negatives I heard about the California prison system. You could trick up your time real easy, turn three years into a life sentence, stuff like that. But that could happen in any prison if you join a certain group or run with certain people that have a hierarchy. If you're a lone wolf in it, you could trick up your time just defend yourself from a group of guys trying to take your cheeks. Either way, there's always going to be risks involved. Everybody's ride is different. It's all up to you and what type of person you are. Hey, this is the lower yard, and the inmates segregate themselves out here. Uh, the reason being that the gangs want it that way. The blacks are over here. The northern Hispanics is our, our main gang here in San Quentin. And it's because they're better organized. Okay, the white guys are over here on the parallel bars and on the picnic table. Now, over in the corner, you see where the Asians are sitting. You can't just walk and sit on the tape. I had to explain that. I'd almost got in a confrontation with that two or three times because, you know, I saw a table, I sat down. It's not like that. You gotta, you gotta ask for, for permission to sit down there. Now, just like he said, he had to ask where to sit certain places in the prison. I wasn't used to none of that when I was doing time. If I seen a seat, I would pull up and park. Didn't matter about what color you were, nothing. The only time the seat position really mattered, you might be taking someone's seat to me, was in the chow hall. You know, I've had situations like that when I went to a prison for the first time, sat at a couple of tables that might have been loaded underneath of them with some contraband that I didn't know about. They gladly informed me and I got up and moved. But other than that, man, it was pretty much wide open as to where I could sit, walk, didn't matter what phone I used or what TV I watched. Some prisons code of conduct goes strictly by race. They have a minister of defense and his thing is he's to have 10 weapons ready at any time down here on this yard. Their weapons are all hid over there. And in the morning we'll come over and we'll search that area and, and try to find their weapons but they're getting better and better at the way they hide their weapons. As you see, this one guy keeps looking around and uh, he's got the heavy coat on. The temperature's pretty hot, so they're, they're the soldiers. They wear these jackets, it's a little bit more armor. If uh, anything goes on, they're the first ones to get involved. And that's absolutely true, man. You'd be walking the yard hot as hell outside, but they got jackets strapped all the way up. I told a story in the past as well about this. Uh, There's a lot of these young gang members in the cell block and they would walk around with these black gloves, right? Wool gloves or something with a beanie and black shades and their jacket on 24 seven. They look like prison hitmen for real. And that's exactly what they were for the most part. You get out of line around the wrong people, they're gonna be coming to see you. But we're about to hear from someone speak about what happens if you know these certain groups get into it with each other. If it's a racial situation, you have to respond according to your, your race, racial background. You know, if I'm standing next to this man here, and he's suddenly attacked by another racial group, even if I don't know him, he's black. I'm obligated by myself to assist this man. You know what I'm saying? If it's a white thing, then, you know, you get in it. If it's with the whites and another race or something, you know, then you got to be a part of it, you know, but... There's something else, I just turn my head, I don't even want to see it, you know? I've stabbed people because of what I've had to do, you know? I can't go, you can't go against the program. Now we're traveling to another notorious prison, Corcoran. Hopefully I pronounced that right. This guy, he was put on a mission to stab an older, weaker gang member that I believe was a part of his own organization. And that's another thing a lot of people don't understand is you would think that these groups are beefing all the time, which they are, you know, uh, silently behind closed doors and stuff like that. There's always gonna be some animosity, no matter what with certain groups. But this is the thing. You'd be surprised how much, I guess you could call it cleaning up house when individuals from the same gang are putting hits on their own people. Happens a lot, man. So a lot of these guys that people think that they're really close with or they're connected to, if you run up a little bit of debt or something, they'll be the first ones to come take you out. You're just eating with them or whatever. And usually that's how it goes. You know, they want to get someone that's friendly to you next to you to get you because you ain't going to think it's coming. I had a guy on my channel uh, a few years back said that he was put on a mission to hit his friend up. And he said when he did it, he made it look like he was going full force, but really he was holding back. He didn't want the guy to die. So, you know, it can be tricky, but this guy's about to tell his story about stabbing an older gang member inmate. I accepted that because that's the way it is. You know, I didn't question it. You know, some things I was against, but, you know, 
I just dealt with it and accepted it because that's the way, that's the law of the land in here. We couldn't keep up with the exercise. You know, that was the reason. This is how stupid this is. You know, the, the dumb reasons they have in here. And when I did speak up for him, you know, it was placed on me. Well, since you're speaking up for him, then you'll deal with it. I dealt with it because that's what it was about. Wow. So uh, he was forced to go hit someone from his own group because he wasn't keeping up with the military style exercises that they got. And you know, a lot of groups has something that I have never seen in Virginia. All right. They force you to work out very militant, right? Wake up. If you're not there doing what they got to do, then you're going to get killed. Chances are, or at least hurt quite a bit, you know? So, but like this guy said, he stood up for him and they say, oh, you want to stand up for him, huh? Well, you can handle him too. That's crazy, right? Standing up for the guy and then realizing that you're forced to go punish him. And you heard what he said, man. You, you don't go against a program. A lot of these guys on some of these prison channels say they would not go with the program in California. And I say to myself, will you be dead? I wrote him a letter and I apologized. And I told him uh, that I was sorry that I had to do that. I was so weak. And I didn't, you know, protect him. I should have, you know. I was in a position to protect him and I didn't. So homeboy put into work, but immediately after he dropped out the gang. I've definitely seen gang members be forced, okay, in prison, personally, right next to me, happening, right before my eyes. Friends forced to go beat up their friends because the gang shot caller would ever want to test, if I were to guess, you know, his loyalty. It's a dirty game, man. Gang life in prison, tricky one as well. They got rules and we got rules within the rules. I mean, you know, among our own peoples or, or among different races. You know, but we have to deal with it. I mean, you know, I can't elaborate too much on it, you know. Next, we're going to hear from a guy that actually left an organization uh, in, in California. When you do something like this, they call you a dropout. And a lot of times these individuals go to these special yards called SNY yards. I don't know if that's where this guy is at. I don't know where he's talking from. I'm just saying that's typically the process. And in every state, really, when you leave a gang, chances are you're going to have a rough time. As for what soured myself on the gang life, in all honesty, is I open my eyes to see it for what it is. It's all a bunch of betrayals and lies. There's no loyalty. There's no honor. There's no respect. I've seen too many, too many innocent people being targeted that had nothing to do with the gang life. Just because one of their family members were a part of it, you ain't supposed to target innocent people. My word of advice to him is to remember two things. One, that he's not in control of his life. Because as long as he's a part of this game, there's someone he has to answer to. Whether he believes he's his own man, that's a myth. Because someone's running his program. So he could walk around with his head puffed up, his chest out and everything, and think that he's really badass. But he's gonna follow orders just like anyone else. For every badass, there's someone badass. Oh, it's cut off, but it says Miguel Perez remains in protective custody. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but that's where a lot of these individuals, like I said, that drop out go to. These protective yards, SMY yards, stuff like that. Now, you know, I don't know anything about this guy or if what he's saying is true, but I can only imagine getting attacked in prison and you have nothing to do with anything. You're just getting attacked because your family member is a part of some kind of rival organization or did something wrong in the past. Pretty crazy, but it happens. It's been happening all throughout time. You get connected with the wrong crowd and you're doing work for them. If you mess up, you know, they'll threaten to take out your whole family if you don't do something. So yeah, this type of stuff has been happening. And uh, another thing that he said that I realized very early in life and I didn't want no parts of was I don't want no telling me what to do and if you're a part of a gang unless you are the alpha of that organization which is very rare then you're gonna be told as well what to do you know and that's something that never appealed to me but then again I was in a state where you could do that you know walk the line by yourself now we've been jumping around from prison to prison seeing how the code of conduct is in these places but one thing that stays the same regardless of where you're at is how people with sex crimes is looked at. They are considered to be no good. No matter how severe or minute the situation was, if you got sex crimes on your record, you're gonna have an extremely hard time in prison. But believe it or not, you know, in some places, especially in Virginia where I was at, a lot of these guys, they get through the cracks, go unnoticed. But that's just because, you know, when I was in, they didn't have no strict paperwork check process. Murderers, robbers, they're up here. 
Child molesters, rape well, they're down here. Them guys on the bottom deck, most of them guys are sex offenders, you know? I don't like them, I just tolerate them. I used to beat them while you say so. I used to pray on them. These guys are brothers, and believe it or not, their father's locked up for some dirty paperwork. Let's see how they would handle the situation if their own father was in the cell block. My father was in here for, uh, I don't know the exact charge, but he was in here for messing with kids. And, you know, I ain't cool with that. I was never incarcerated with him. When I found out that he was getting incarcerated, what he did time for, what he got charged for, they asked me if there would be any problems if we were in the same prison. I told him, yeah, I probably ended up killing him. I just, I cannot condone that. These guys are speaking from an Iowa prison, but can you imagine uh, having your own father locked up with you with some dirty paperwork? Man, I can't imagine that, but these guys said it don't matter. They would get them regardless. Now, let's hear from one of these guys that actually do have bad paperwork coming from a Utah prison. This guy's going to speak his mind a bit. There's not a safer place anywhere in the prison than where I'm at. No matter what you do, no matter how you try to approach it, you are a worthless piece of crap because you are a sex offender. You're a useless mole. That's all, I, that's the way everybody talks to you in here. Ah, oh, you're a mole, huh? Molester. You're one of those. But I have seen guys get stabbed. I saw a guy get a piece of a shovel handle stuck right in the side of his neck. And I've seen a guy get a hammer took to him and just beat the side of his head to a wreck. I've got a safety list that's got at least 20 names on it with people that told me in no uncertain terms, you're a dead man if we ever get our hands on it. So that guy's in the hole for being disruptive. And he said, this is the safest place I can be. See, some places don't have PCRs. They just have a hole. And in order to get the protection that you want, you're either going to have to name someone and it has to be something dramatic to the point where they keep you back there or just get in trouble over and over again that's why a lot of these killers that you see stuck in the hole for 20 years is because a lot of them they got bad paperwork too you know so they they'll act treacherous when they hit the main line just to get back to that seg unit it happens and don't get it twisted man a lot of these guys with the bad paperwork they're trained to go as well they want to go to the hole so what do you think they're gonna do to you to get there now we're going to travel down to Kern Valley State Prison in California. I've heard some pretty treacherous stories coming from this prison and this happens to be someone with bad paperwork explaining what he could go through over there in California if he was in the mainline general population. On the mainline, I'd be dead in a day. Because they, those guys over there, they just wouldn't care. They, they would kill me right in front of an officer because it's a notch on their belt. You know, I've participated in helping hunt for child molesters. You know, well, this guy said, oh, he's a child molester, and this is a child molester, and you catch him out in the yard, and you go through his stuff and look, read his paperwork and see what he's really here for. You know, then yes, he is, or no, he's not. Well, generally, um, somebody will catch him in a day room or TV room or whatever and punch him in the mouth, tell him to roll it up now. And if he blinks twice or hesitate just a little bit, like I was saying a minute ago, if you sit down and you try, well, wait a minute, let me explain. Too late. Now you're beat up, stabbed, whatever. They take it to the next level immediately. Uh, if you are to ask me where he was at, it was probably a lower level pod. And uh, so nobody's trying to get a body and not go home, you know. So they'll hit him in the face and tell him to roll it up. I can see that. But definitely, you get to the higher level prisons, man, they're just going to kill. But there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit about the convict code from state to state. You want to mess with minors, take cheeks and stuff like that on the streets. Then when you get to prison, trust and believe someone's going to be taking something from you. That's a fact, man. That's just how it goes. And that is one of the convict codes that's universal from state to state, man. You know, uh, watching these videos, it's like me being in prison all over again. It keeps my mind right. Makes me realize that I don't want no parts of that life ever again. That's all I got for y'all today. Hopefully you enjoyed, learned a few things, and uh, I got a lot of interviews lined up. So be on the lookout for some fresh ones. They should be coming your way very shortly. Not to mention I've been working on my new art piece. Uh, let me give you a quick look at it. It's got kind of an aerial vibe because I gave her red hair, but this is the centerpiece. I just started it. Should be uh, a good one, to say the least. As you can see, it's a little, got the scales going. Uh, six foot board again I'm going to have uh, the mermaid it's going to have light beaming up from beaming down from the top of the ocean 
you know, bubbles, reef scene at the bottom, fish, sunken pirate ship will be down here somewhere in the distance. It's going to be a beautiful board. Just take a closer look at the uh, mermaid there. It's going to be a good one. I can't wait to show you all the progress as we go along. And not to mention, these puppies are still for sale as well. If you want to purchase one of these pieces, then go to my Etsy page. It's linked in the description. But as always, until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, y'all be easy, be safe, and stay free.